Hi, everybody. My name is John Hecklinger. I'm president and CEO of Global Fund for Children, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the fourth annual Julia Jamone Courage Awards event. Um, just a quick introduction of, of why we're here. Um, Juliet Jimon was a great friend of Global Fund for Children for many years and served as the chair of our board. Uh, she passed away in 2018, and in her memory, we launched this fund uh, with core funding from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and additional support from many of Juliet's friends, family, colleagues, and others that she uh, inspired. And we are absolutely thrilled to be able to give these awards every year in, in Juliet's memory. So for the fourth year in a row, we're recognizing innovative grassroots organizations around the world that positively impact young people in especially challenging circumstances. Um, so most of our recipients have overcome significant ob obstacles to launch courageous, innovative initiatives that transform the systems that prevent young people from reaching their full potential. Uh, awardees have demonstrated resilience, they've thrived in amazingly difficult uh, circumstances and contexts, and as we'll hear today, uh, these organizations have leaders who have navigated uh, personal and professional challenges and hardships, and then channel channeled that energy and that adversity into amazing impact and success uh, within their organizations. So this year, we're celebrating three winners. And since there were so many courageous uh, organizations nominated through our process, uh, the selection committee decided to create a new category of recognition that we're calling honorees. So we actually have five organizations uh, to celebrate today, and you'll hear directly from the leaders of three of them. So um, our 2022 Julia Jimon Courage Award winners are Afghan Institute of Learning in Afghanistan, or we'll referred to them as AIL. And uh, many of you are familiar with, uh, with their work, but uh, for those of you who aren't, they've um, heroically increased access to education in Afghanistan by providing girls and women with private schools and learning centers, fostering literacy, and you know, persevering in incredibly difficult circumstances, especially uh, in the last year. Our second winner is the Parents of Children with Autism Initiative in Tajikistan, and we'll refer to them as Eroda. Uh, and Aroda provides access to quality services appropriate for the unique needs of children and youth with autism spectrum disorders and trains professionals and parents how to work with children with ASD and also works closely with the government to change policy. Um, our third winner is Women Against Violence and Exploitation in Society, and we'll, call, we'll refer to them as WAVES in Sierra Leone. Uh, Waves empowers girls to speak out against sexual and gender-based violence and to advocate for their sexual and reproductive health and rights while engaging adults in the community to adopt more supportive attitudes and practices. So these organizations uh, have navigated conflict and pandemic uh, and harmful prejudices to defend the rights of children and youth to access quality education. Um, and now our special honorees are Yanapana Kusin in Peru, which provides housing, access to education, and other support to child and adolescent laborers, migrants, trafficking survivors, as well as to other young people in vulnerable circumstances in Peru. And we're also happy to recognize Warriors Zulu Nation Honduras in Honduras. And Warrior Zulu Nation uh, empowers youth and neighborhoods with uh, significant gang presence to practice different art forms like hip hop and break dancing while uh, exploring social issues that impact their communities. So we'll hear uh, more from AIL and uh, Aroda and Waves shortly. Uh, but first, I'd uh, love to bring in Marianne Jimon Danzenborg to tell us a little bit about her sister, Juliet and you know, why these organizations uh, embody her courageous spirit uh, so, so fully. So hi, Marianne, thanks so much for, 
for joining us today. Um, and yeah, can you just tell us a little bit more about, uh, about your system? Sure. Listen, John, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for everybody for joining. Um, I am Juliet's uh, little sister, and I have a little picture of her here. Um, we sort of look alike, and I wish I had a picture of her in action because you could really get more of a sense of her fiery spirit, um, which fortunately her daughter also has. Um, I think we chose to do this prize because we want to recognize courageous leaders working with kids who don't often get um, recognized, uh, often same as parents who don't always get recognized. I think my sister as a single parent, you know, did, did a lot. I think that's, that was a very courageous act um, that, that she did. And I, um, I can't believe it's already the fourth year, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. And we have yeah. three amazing awardees. I think what's unusual about this year is that it's the first time that one of the awardees, uh, Sakina Yakobi of the Afghan Institute of Learning, actually knew my sister. Mm -hmm. And um, Julia introduced me to Sakina, um, I think over 20 years ago when Sakina spoke at the Global Philanthropy Forum, which Julia had been a co-founder of. And mm -hmm. I remember Julia being like, you have to meet Sakina. It's in, she's incredible. She's, she created these secret schools in Afghanistan during the Taliban regime. Um, and I think no one could have imagined that there's now a second Taliban regime in place, but you guys are in for a treat because Sakina is going to explain to you um, what creative measures they're doing to reach out to many kids that are being closed out of the education system. I wanted to say is, you know, we're not only just recognizing the courage of Lola, Hannah, and Sakina today, but their creativity. They're working in environments that are so challenging. They're, you know, limited resources, but there are just so many other restrictions and roadblocks, and they are constantly troubleshooting and finding ways to reach these kids with love, compassion, and perseverance, which is not something that everybody has. And we can't wait to share the stories of, of these leaders with you guys. Um, John, I know that this Global um, Fund for Children's staff has done a wonderful video and uh, I think that will give us a first taste. Yep, sounds good. So yeah, let's um, learn a little bit more about the work of these three organizations uh, and cue the video. Thanks, Marianne. Really appreciate it.
So now I'd uh, love to welcome uh, Maya and Sakina into the conversation. Uh, two amazingly inspiring leaders who have had a big influence on me. Um, uh, I've, it's been a real pleasure getting to know uh, both of you over the years, and I know you two go, go way back. So Maya Ajmera is the founder of Global Fund for Children and now president and CEO of Society for Science and also publisher of Science News. And Dr. Sakina Yakubi is founder and executive director of Afghan Institute of Learning and you know, one of GFC's uh, earliest partners. So uh, Maya and Sakina, I'll turn it over to you. Sakina, it is so wonderful always uh, to see you and and to have this chance uh, to chat for, for, for a few minutes. Um, I wanna talk about Juliet and Juliet Gimon and the force of nature that she was, but I wanna start with a story. Um, so the story is, is I remember meeting you at a girls and human rights conference and you came up to me and said, Maya, I'm going across the border from Peshawar, Pakistan to, um, uh, to Afghanistan, to, to Kabul and Jalalabad, we need to fund these secret homeschools for girls. And I said, send us a proposal. And I remember when I brought that proposal to our board of directors, I have notes in my big notebook, Sakina, and I was taking notes and, um, Juliette Gimon and Dina Kimball and Adele Richardson Ray and Bill Asher said, this has to be funded and has to be funded immediately. Um, I'll never forget Juliet feeling so strongly about the situation in Afghanistan um, at that time under the rule of the Taliban. And then if we fast forward a couple of years I don't know if you remember, but the Taliban had fallen September 11th, and I called you um, the day after, and I said, what can we do to help? And I remember Juliet had told me, Maya, let's get in touch with some of our partners around the world. I said, absolutely, I'm on it, um, if there's anything we can do. And, and you picked up the phone, and you said, I can't believe you're calling. And I said, of course we're going to call. What can we do to help you now? And you said we need to help support the boys who are on the street as well and who deserve to get an education as well. And that sort of built this sort of long-term relationship with the Afghan Institute of Learning and you, Sakina, and of course, Marianne bringing up um, the wonderful, uh, as Juliet said, your, you know, bringing you to the Global Philanthropy Forum, the first one, to basically showcase the important work that you've been doing. So Sakina, um, that, that's sort of the, the overlay of the history uh, for our audience to understand uh, why uh, your organization and the work you were doing is so courageous and so important. So Sakina, uh, maybe a few words um, about your relationship with Juliet, but also just the work um, at that time, but also where, are we today? Well, thank you very much, Maya. First of all, I want to thank everyone who is involved in Julia Gamon uh, Courage Award. I really appreciate that very, very much. And I think that the world appreciate it, especially Julia being such a wonderful human being, such a thoughtful person, such a um, uh, energetic, uh, such a, a creative person in her own way that I really, um, I, it's a great honor for me today to talk to her. I prefer to talk more about her than about my work because the way I know Julia and the way I get to be friend, close friend with her, um, you could not believe it, Maya. Yes, you talk about the time that uh, uh, we had the secret school underground and you guys funded us. And also, yes, you talk about the, uh, the boys that you guys helped me to uh, give program, education program for. But also, I want to just tell you a little story about Julia. I was in New York and I went to visit some people. 
And I called Julia and I said, um, how are you? Can we have a cup of uh, coffee or tea with each other? She said, yes. And so she came right away and we had a cup of uh, coffee together. And then I talked to her about the program. She asked about the program and I said, Julia, I really um, want to ask you, but I don't want you to do it, but I really need some computer laptop. And you know, these young people, this youth group that I am working, youngs and boys, and they really need some a computer. And I really could not buy inside Afghanistan. It's too expensive. And from here also. And then she asked me, can you take it with you? I said, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, right now, I will be able to carry with me inside Afghanistan. She said, how many hours you give me? Just like that. And I said, well, I will be here in New York and whatever. Um, time you want, you can, because I will leave tomorrow. She said, okay. As a matter of fact, she called uh, uh, Marianne and she said, you two uh, sit together and have a cup of tea and I will go after that. And um, putting tears to my eyes because she, she called somewhere, she find five laptop, brand new laptop. And then she brought the guy who is going to program it just to make sure that everything is working. Just there, right in uh, Marianne's apartment, we sit there and this guy fixed everything. It, everything is ready to go. And he handed to, she handed to me this five computer laptop. I never can forget. I was, first of all, I was so amazed by this um, generosity of this young woman and also by how fast she put the words in action. I am a kind of person that I like action. I take it and go after it. And here, this Julia in New York City and being who is Julia and doing that work, it's made me that just, I was saying, my God, this is somebody that really mean what she's doing. And she is really showing us that she is really with the heart in this work. And so I never forget that. I never ever forget. And those computers, I took it inside Afghanistan. And do you know that until three years ago, those computers was functioning very, very well. And everybody was using, all young uh, girls and young boys were using that in our Empower Education class. And so I just, I have such a good memory of Julia. She was wonderful with her with children. Also, I saw her with her child, with her daughter. And um, it, is, it is something that I'm sure she's about this guy watching us. And she is laughing for me, Sakina, because always I just had her and just uh, she, she was a different individual, very different individual with a very um, hard um, uh, feeling with compassion and with love because nowadays, it's very hard to find people like that. And so that is a little story I wanted to share with you that Julia was not anyone. Julia was very special and very unique in her own way reaching out. She didn't talk about it. She didn't just splash. She didn't make a big banner or show it. She just in a quiet way that she was doing it. And that is the Julia that I know. And that's the Julia that I loved the rest of my, li my life. And that's about Julia. Uh, well, um, you talk about uh, what's about our program. You know that our program is mainly objective is that to teach girls education, teach them education, how to learn, read and write. But that has went behind that. It's, it's right now AIL is one of the largest women organization in Afghanistan. We serve thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands uh, girls and boys in Afghanistan. During the Taliban underground, we had about 80 school underground, 3,000 students. But again, the Taliban, the fall of the Taliban, then we came to Afghanistan. Now again, the Taliban are back. And we were talking about creativity, innovation. As a social entrepreneur, as somebody who is really thinking very fast and do critical thinking, I really decided that right now the school are closed. All the school for girls are closed. Nobody can go to a school from 7th grade to 12th grade. And so you know that we have a TV channel right now. We have a TV station. And so, um, and I, with my, my team, sit and thought about it, how we can get the education back on the, on the ground, that it will be used until the situation 
solve their they, they solve the problem. So we created a curriculum that is broadcast televised through the television, that is teaches from seventh grade to 12th grade, all the subjects of a school, no matter if it's a social or it's science or it's a, um, whatever uh, topic we teach in school from seventh grade to 12th, it's all on the um, televised through a, a TV. We give our time, invest a lot of money, and we choose the best teacher, the best training teacher, to teach these children in front of the TV screen, they are great. And they can sit in front of TV and watch this lesson and go and pass the test and go forward from. Yes, it is not a school. It's not a school environment. Psychologically, it's not that way. But at least something that the children can learn, at least until the time that uh, those people decide that if the school is going to open or the system will change, whatever. So this is something that I am very proud of it. And it's just a start a month ago and it is televising every day and we have a lot of audience and they are keep asking it. And also I want to ask, tell you that one other thing that I did with the Courage Award money that I think that the audience will be happy and John will be happy and you will be happy as the uh, co-founder of uh, um, Children Global Fund for Children. When I got the award two years ago, I spent that money to the preschool uh, playground because I know Julia would like that. And so I fixed the playground in our preschool. And so it has like swing, it has slide, it has all these things that you have for children here. So I set it up that the children enjoy that so much because it's a protected environment. They are safe, they go play around that. And you know, in Afghanistan situation is not that free, things are not available. So when we play, use that playground, Every child is just blossoming and laughing and smiling and playing around. So that is the, the, the money that we use for that. And I'm sure John will be happy and Marianne will be happy. And Julia, of course, will be happy because that is she would love to do. Yes. So, Sakina, um, I want to ask you just about, you know, your vision of you've been so courageous for so long, right? From the time that you founded AIL to the work that your team is doing, I find the TV show to be fabulous. Uh, that's that's a that's very creative um, in terms of getting around a problem and doing it well. Sakina, where do you, I mean, where do you see this work going in Afghanistan for the future? I mean, one of the things that's made you so highly um, very powerful is that you never worked with the government, whether it was the Taliban or not. And that's why you're, the, the rumor on the street is you actually can work with the governments because you never put yourself or lodge yourself with, with anyone. So tell me what you believe the future is for AIL and for yourself. Well, um, uh, Maya, I think that is a very excellent question that you ask, and I think the world should know that. The world should know that what Afghanistan is all about and what's going on in Afghanistan. First of all, the world should know that Afghanistan is a tradition country. It's a country that with all this belief in tradition is set up from the beginning. And also the world should know that 99% of the public of Afghanistan were uneducated. They were not thinking, they were not reading and writing. So, and to deal with that kind of society, what you need, you don't need a, a tank and a gun and a soldier to bring peace in that country. If you really want to bring peace in that country, you really need education, you need creativity, you need critical thinking, you need women because half of the population are women. And so you need all these issues to work on it. And how do you work on this issue? You cannot just tell people be happy, be, be free, choose your side or be healthy. These are the things that you get through education. You are educated, you can defend yourself, you can stand on your right, you can have self-confidence, you can have resilience, all those issues, you can have it when you are you're educated. And that is, I am just between me and you. I'm telling you, Maya, education gave us status, gave us position, gave us the name, gave us stability. 
And I think that every individual in every part of the world, they deserve that because they are human beings. They are equal to us. They are whatever we want for ourselves. Those women, those girls need for themselves. For me, I, did, I am not a politician. I did not work with politics at all. And when the two system that came, when Karzai government came and when any uh, government came, both of those systems, they asked me to work with them to as a minister of education or as minister of health because I do thousands and thousands of girls education or health education or health clinics, all those things. But I told them, no, I do not want to work you. I do not want this chair. I do not want this position. Both of them were shocked. They were upset. Why? Why you don't? I said, because I feel comfortable in my corner with AI, because my objective is to really educate, educate the people like a factory, produce it and let it go, produce it and let it go. And that's happening with AI. We train 1,000, we train so far 39,000 teachers in a very best methodology that it's update methodology in teaching today. And we send them to our school. And we, we, uh, we reach 14.5 million people one way or another way. We have 11 clinics inside Afghanistan. Right now, do you know that 260 clinics in hospital has been closed inside Afghanistan, but AOL clinic are all open and every one of them are functioning. Why? Because we believe that the door should be open and we should get, get our way around how to work with people, how to work because we work with community after community. People love us, people come for service for us. So the government, uh, they maybe don't like me, they don't like what I'm doing, but they also see that I do it in a way that I am not threat to anybody. I am not threat to the culture, I am not threat to the um, community, I am not threat, threat to the, even the government. I just stay in my corner, do my work in any way that is not pinpoint anybody. Like today, a lot of people are asking me, Sakina, the schools are closed. Sakina, the girls are not going to school. What do you think? I said, well, you know, I hope someday it will open because that is my dream, but my school are open. My school are open and the TV screen. So that's what I would say. My Sakina. Yes. So, so I, I could, we could keep hearing the energy and the passion. I have tears, you know, I am so honored. Um, I just want to say to the audience um, what a privilege it is to be able to have this chat with you, Sakina. Congratulations on receiving the Juliet G. Mon Courage Award. To Juliet, my dear friend, who was the chair of the board and helped me build Global Fund for Children, you're up there and you're watching above. I want to say thank you to the audience, but Sakina, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. everything that you're doing. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Sakina. Thank you, Maya. And for those of you who don't, don't click over there yet, because we have uh, a lot more uh, amazing and, and inspiration to go, but uh, Sakina does have an extraordinary TED Talk, How I Stopped the Taliban from Shutting Down My School. So um, if you would like to hear more from Sakina on your own time, I would highly recommend that TED Talk. Uh, but thank you so much. And, and now I'd... Um, Love to bring in Hannah and Lola uh, to the conversation. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Lola. And just by way of introduction, um, Hannah Yambasu is founder and executive director of WAVES, Women Against Violence and Exploitation in Society in Sierra Leone. And Dr. Lola Nazridi, Nazridinova is uh, founder and executive director of Aroda in uh, Tajikistan. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. Um, and you know, as I, uh, one of my favorite things in, in this job is to kind of hear the, the stories of how you know, amazingly innovative, action-oriented, driven individuals you know, how it came to start the organizations that they did. So you know, Lola, maybe I can start with you. Can you share a little bit about your story and how that story you know, led you to uh, found Aroda. Thank you so much, John, but 
first of all, I would like to uh, uh, show my gratitude and uh, heart thankful to you all, uh, to Global Fund for Children for this uh, Courage Award. And of course, thank you so much for previous speakers. It was so inspired to hear their uh, memory story about Juliet. And it also remember me how me, we've met first Global Fund for Children. We've met with Joseph Bednarek. It was such a great story of partnership almost 10 years ago. So first of all, thanks uh, to you all and thanks to all partners and friends who helped us to create this uh, parents network in Tajikistan for, from all these, for all these years. Thank you so much. And of course, congratulations to Hannah and Dr. Sakina. I'm of course proud of you and this um, award was very unexpected for us because you both are an outstanding and significant first persons and they're doing, you are doing such a great work in, uh, in your country so I, I'm admire of you a lot. My story started from my personal situation for my family when my youngest son was diagnosed with autism. It was more than 50 years ago and uh, we faced with the family with um, quite difficulties with uh, um, that time it was a kind of medication and medical approach and there was not um, um, professionals who were able to help us uh, and of course we as the parents we were worrying about his development but it was um, my life changed actually a lot when I've met um, two wonderful uh, women. One was mother of a child with, of the child with disability, Rachel Tange from Scotland, and another was a professional, Karen Purdy from Australia. So they helped me to learn a lot and uh, uh, to learn the international experience. So at that time, I've met lots of great mothers all over the world, uh, and they showed their uh, experience, they showed their uh, example for us. And then we thought, oh, why we couldn't start the same things in Tajikistan? So then we've met with mothers in Tajikistan, it was five mothers of us, we supported each other psychologically, we learned a lot, we went abroad, so we gathered this information and then we decided to set up the parents organization. So it was very important steps and lots of fears were for us to start that, but uh, our children <laughs> gave us a little courage for that and of course we're all thankful to all professionals and friends and partners all over the world who helped us uh, to learn about this comprehensive approach towards uh, education and therapy for children with autism, for their inclusion, for their employment already now, and for all different kind of support programs with, which we could provide to uh, children and professionals, of course, and families, of course. Well, th thanks so much, Lola. And uh, Hannah would invite you, you back on camera. Um, and you know, the same, same question for you. I uh, would love to hear more about uh, your uh, personal story and, and how it led you to uh, launch your, your work with, with Waves. Hannah um, is in a part of Sierra Leone that has um, not the best internet, so maybe, oh, here she is. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Okay, um, I want to say thank you so much to Boba Fund for children and also for um, bringing us on board and into this partnership, um, identifying waves as one partner that um, GFC could work with. And uh, I want to appreciate the team also especially my colleague, Amy, for digging me out because the moment Amy saw me, she realized that there was something in, in, in the organization and there's something in me that we have not shown out. And then uh, I want to say, Amy, thank you for pressing me positively for bringing what is out today and for the award that we're going to get today. Um, actually, it has been a long journey and uh, I want to say that um, myself as a victim of child preferential. I was not loved. I was neglected. I was not given the privilege that a child, a girl child should need from the mother. And uh, we are two as a sister, but she was given the best. And she went to a public school, I went to a private school. And also um, I'm a victim of child abuse. I was abused twice, one at the age of eight. And uh, 
by an adult man who was uh, actually hosted by my father in our home. But at that time, no one could talk about sexual abuse. I mean, it was not in the law book. So I couldn't talk to anybody. I kept it. And I went to that. <clears throat> my mom actually, um, to be very honest, didn't care less about me. But um, so there was no way to report. My second abuse was that um, I was 12, one, an abuser. My mom wanted me to get married at an early age of two and which I resisted. And that actually brought in the conflict between me and my mom because she wanted me to get married and I didn't want. Um, so um, being abused the second time, again, I didn't have the bold to, bold to say that, um, to report the matter to my parents because fear that they might not believe me. So it's like, um, I was going that, that pain pain of ill treatment from my mom and pain because of the abuse I've gone through, which I cannot report on. It, it was a sad moment, it has been a sad moment, and I've been carrying this. And also, you know, the situation got worse because I was unable to tell my parents and I carried this on and the abuser keep giving my mom gifts um, knowing to my father, he believes that this guy was just an, an innocent person, he friendly to our to the family. And um, I had to go through that situation. I didn't have any we had to complain. But um over time, when I started working, you know, this passion of me to work to help girls and women not to go through what I went through. Came on board when I started working for international organization. I started seeing things that I could actually tap on to help. And especially when at that time we had this war, 11 years of, uh, when I say, um, war that started on the 10th of March and was declared ended on the 18th of um, January 2002. During those periods, I saw a lot of carnage. Women, girls being abused, boys being recruited by both the militias, the militias, and also the rebels. And um, for me, it was bleeding in my heart. And uh, there was no justice for all those issues that were happening because, as I say, in those times, there was no statute to protect girls, women, and boys. So there was no one to complain. So during the war, Seen all these atrocities, property destroyed, potentials of girls and women and boys be destroyed. Working also with the international NGOs that I work with, I try to really avail myself to learn more of advocacy skills so that how I can actually engage governments to ensure that this carnage ends after the war. And the opportunity came after the war, we started working. And um, when I left my, 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 my former employment and I decided to start an organization called Women Against Violence and Exploitation Society, and my priority areas were to want to advocate for those girls that have been sexually abused, forced in marriage, to see how we can bring them out or fight for them to make sure that these laws are actually implemented and to ensure that they are protected. And um, when that, um, when I actually um, started this organization, it had a sense, but we worked hard because my focus was not to, um, was not based on how I can find money for myself, but how we can actually have money to help salvage these girls. And so we actually, worked hard to have a law in Sierra Leone. And notwithstanding that, during the uh, Ebola, we saw another abuse of girls, whereby many girls became pregnant because they were um, breadwinners, they've lost their parents during the course of the Ebola. Some actually couldn't find, parents couldn't feed them. So as usual, they were taken advantage of 
and most of them had pregnancy. But the crux of the matter, what actually moved me more, putting my, my passion into work, was when the government of Sierra Leone said that these pregnant girls should not take their public exam. That actually I was crazy, drive, drive me crazy. And I was like, I'm shouting in the office, we have to do something. It made me mad. I mean, I want to apologize to my colleagues at that time because I was like, not knowing what to do, you know? I couldn't believe if this girl should be treated, punished twice. One, Ebola caused them to become pregnant because men took advantage of them. The government is supposed to, to protect them, say no, they should not attend school. And what is their future tomorrow? So, um, knowing Hannah that I couldn't relent so easily, when I'm, when I'm in for something and I want to say an end to it, I fight for it. So my fight was one to actually link myself to organization who can help to see we can bring the government to book. As you, can, as you know, in our African continent, uh, uh, continent and even in Sierra Leone, when you challenge government, two options. One, maybe they will arrest you. Two, my organization would have been asked to close because they will seize my um, certificate or they will not um, renew my um, end, user, my end user certificate. So, but I took the risk and uh, we partnered with um, Equality Now and we did a lot of work, a bit of findings. And at the end of the day, we'll be able to take the matter to court. But I want to say to my colleagues that during that time, I was having backlashes. Some of my colleagues, they say, what is immoral? How can you take girls who are pregnant in school to go into the mainstream education, that you are influencing other girls to become pregnant, and the whole school become pregnant girls. That should not happen. You know, for my religious belief, that is what is very immoral. It should not. But one thing that stand stand tall in me that I will preserve life than to destroy life. Those girls are pregnant, but it is not by choice. It is because of their vulnerability. That's why they have, they became pregnant. Well, if we sit and wait until they, they deliver, remember, school academic year is from September to June, right? So are they going to wait for one whole academic year or maybe more than that before they go to school? What adventure in the process, they become pregnant again. So this thought was in my mind to say that we'll go for this. And I still thought to say, that I will represent these girls in Syria. Not all of them will know me, but they will know me at the end of the day. And I did ask for fame for that. I sacrificed my own integrity. I sacrificed my organization and I sacrificed my family to make sure that these girls, they, have, they will have a justice. We went to the ECOWAS court. On two occasions, we went. The first occasion, where it was uh, uh, John, but the second occasion, we came back to a lot of lobby, a lot of engagements, international as well as national, to make sure to make the, the ECOWAS court to see that there's need for these girls to go back to school. And the second attempt we went, to God be the glory, these girls won, they won the case because not Hannah is not with. I will not take the, I will not take it because I was not the one. I was not the one who was, who we are humiliated, who we are booed at. But these were the girls who actually went through this, this prosecution. So when they, when they, when we did the, 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 the court, court declared and gave a commission to government, when I walked out of that court, I said, the girls, they have won this case. And I'll continue to say they have won this case. And today, I'm happy that many pregnant girls have gone back to school. Many pregnant girls took their exam. And the irony of it all, these girls that they were really discriminating, they did so well, and they have been doing well in all their public exams. So I want to say credit to those girls. And I also say thank you to the GFC for allowing us to bring out these issues for the international world to know that yeah, organization working. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Hannah. And I think, yeah, that's, um, yeah, as I, I look at the trajectory of extremely effective and inspiring organizations, starting from that personal drive and that experience, but then also saying, hey, at the, at the government policy level, what really needs to change to create justice, you know, for, for all and that particular victory uh, that you're able to achieve for girls in Sierra Leone is, is really significant. And, um, and, and, and Lola, I think uh, as well, I mean, you've got a similar trajectory. I mean, 
uh, you mentioned how medical professionals had such limited knowledge of you know how to you know think about it and recognize and and and, and, and work with young people uh, with ASD. Um, you have partnered with uh, government entities, you know, to kind of change change the system. Um, so, uh, one, can you tell us a little bit about that? And um, meanwhile, we can I can start uh, capturing some some questions and bring Sakina uh, back in for a more general conversation. But go ahead, Bola. Thank you. Yes, you're completely right. Um, as I mentioned, my son was diagnosed quite late. So he was almost more than, he was uh, almost six years old at that time. And of course, uh, for, for myself, and I have medical background, this cooperation with doctors was very important. So for the many years in our country, autism not, was not officially recognized. You know, it was uh, misunderstood with diagnosing, with all, uh, you know, this understanding the characteristics of autism. And specifically, there was a big gap in early diagnosing. So for my team and with several doctors, doctors in one team was very important to cooperate with medical professionals and Ministry of Health in order to bring this knowledge, to cooperate together with um, 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 pediatricians, psychiatrists, neurologists. So from 2014, uh, together with uh, international partners, we started to bring this international tools uh, like autism diagnostic observation schedule, autism diagnostic interview, and train doctors together with the Ministry of Health. And that was uh, happening regularly every year. And then gradually we started to saw the differences. And then with from the 2017, almost for last uh, five years, the clinical uh, recommendations and manuals for doctors was uh, prepared. And that was um, extremely good uh, teamwork with the uh, medical professionals on national level and international experts in order to bring this knowledge to uh, government level, professional level. And of course, the recognition of autism is now there. And of course, now we're trying to think about the certification of disability for people with autism, because we really would like it to, to be based on not just on the medical diagnosis, but uh, on the functioning of the person. So we're trying to help uh, medical professionals to realize that the autism is there. This is a diagnosis. But diagnosis is not uh, uh, um, um, it's not about the person, it's not about inclusion, it's not about the quality of life. So even if you have autism, but you have all rights to, for, you know, for, for access for education, for employment, for future, to live in the family, not in the institution, and of course, uh, to all rights that have all children all over the world. So this year, 2000 to 2022, was very important for us because these uh, recommendations, these medical recommendations for doctors were improved on the Ministry of Health level. And now it's a process of implementing and training and distributing this information. And of course, it's uh, and we saw the, re, uh, the uh, achievements already because now the early uh, diagnosing of autism is much uh, better. It's uh, the children who is one and a half or two year old already could be diagnosed. And what is good about that? It's not just about the diag diagnosing, it's because they could get the early intervention, the quality support. They're not getting this all amount of medication, unnecessary medication, which was so popular many years ago. So also it's uh, um, in, uh, including the comprehensive approach, evidence-based approaches to what mm. uh, treatment of autism. So that's why it's very important and we are trying to work hard on this way and uh, specifically my work in organization is on that team in the early intervention team so and my my son is 20 now but uh, I'm still prefer and you know my passion is young children to work with young children because it's also the parenting programs and we would like to support those parents who just face the diagnosis as as early as possible because if we change their uh, life in the beginning uh, the the way of their life and the, their life will be completely changed in future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lola. That's, I mean, another very significant victory, um, having the recognition and like really seeing the results of, you know, young people, you know, getting the support they need much earlier in the process and more appropriate support, but yet the work is, is not uh, ever completely done. <laughs> so going from policy to actually you know, holding 
folks accountable to full implementation and such. Um, uh, and so I, I think there's a, actually, and Sakina, if, if you're comfortable, I'd love to invite you back into the conversation um, on video if you'd like. Um, but I think uh, there's one question that's kind of emerging you know, from the chat that I think is common to the three of you. Maybe we can capture that in, in, in short sound bites given the, 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 uh, the time. But um, I think the, the question is, uh, how can we engage girls in school in order for them to have the education they're yearning for. Three uh, very different, but still similarly challenging contexts. And maybe Sakina, I can, I can start with, with you. I mean, how, how can we you know, engage in school in, the, in your circumstances? Uh, I know the, the, the TV station is, is, is good for now, but how are you thinking about it more long-term? Um, first of all, I want to share this news with you that before the, this uh, new system, the girls were going to school and we were providing education for the girls. And we have girls going from first grade to 12th grade and then going to higher education. But now these things is happening that from 7th grade to 12th grade, they could not go or even they could not go to higher education. And we created this curriculum that they can watch the TV and they learn from it. That's one way. Another way, we learn how to develop a curriculum that we can put it in the flash a pen and send it to family that they can use it. And one another way that is a very creative way, we have 362 women learning center. In this learning center, we were teaching them literacy, we were teaching them about human rights, women's rights, about democracy, about rule of law, that, that, that. But now all of a sudden when the school closed and we said, okay, shift the curriculum of the school into the women learning center. Now the curriculum of the school also in the women learning center. And so from seventh grade to 12th grade, and we are teaching that all of a sudden, we see that the uh, amount of people are coming to the women learning center, double, triple since this issue of the school are closing. So we, we try to reach the girls any way that we could to try to teach them education. Of course, none of these three ways that we are doing is the same as having a school, having a, a, your um, a classmate, having an environment, uh, psychologically also uh, um, uh, this is this is emotionally it's different for girls to take their school on their private own lesson but when the situation is tough then you have to do whatever you can do and especially when they had private school in Afghanistan they have to pay a fee now this system is free everyone can take it without mm -hmm any fees at all. So we invest a lot of money, a lot of our for our television station because it's our television station. So we spend many hours there. We broadcast this light, a lesson for morning, uh, also at noontime, also at night, that if they miss the class in the morning, they can take it another time. So it's free of charge in the best teacher. Even I don't think if as rich as you could be in Afghanistan, you could not hire this private teacher the way that I hire this teacher because they are excellent teacher mm. quality they are very good teacher so that is the way we provide and uh, I hope that someday the school will be open for all girls but right now I could not say that much but we give them patience compassion and love that they go through this process. Uh, and I'm looking forward for Afghanistan. Continuously, I'm looking for Afghanistan. I know a lot of audience want to know what's going to happen to Afghanistan. Is Afghanistan is going to be OK? I believe that Afghanistan is going to be OK because the people of Afghanistan, they love the country. They want to work hard. They are working hard, especially women are resilient. They are working very hard. They improve so much. They transform so much. So I really believe that Afghanistan is going to be OK. But unfortunately, right now, is poverty there. Is a lot of issue that people are not having a skill, not having job, not having money. Is the money also is is freezing for Afghanistan? So that's a big issue. That if you want to send money, it's very hard. You have to send it through Hawala system. These are uh, issues. I think that the international community has to know that that the money goes to the for the people of Afghanistan. It doesn't go to those people. When the money is frozen, people are going to suffer those people are not going to have food. And so you know that 25 million people are right now starving in Afghanistan. Five million children are really malnourished right now in Afghanistan. These are the issues that we really need to discuss 
world widely, you know. So uh, I know we don't have that much time, but <laughs> I appreciate you give me the opportunity to answer this question. Thank you. Thank you very much for everything. Well, yeah, and thanks, Sakina. Um, and uh, I have uh, several thank yous I need to say to folks uh, uh, before we close. But um, uh, Hannah and Lola, just you know, very quickly, what's what's um, what's next for you? Uh, so, Hannah, what, what's what's the next issue that you're you're tackling most on your mind these days? Oh, we may have lost audio. So let me let me turn to you, Lola. What's uh, what's the next big thing that you're you're thinking about? Yes, thank you. So no, as you know, all parents are worrying about the life of their children after they will leave this world. So of course, for many of us, which have already the young adults with disabilities, with quite severe disabilities, is the main question it what will happen with our children when we die. So we already need to think about these programs. We already need to think about the independent living programs, supported um, uh, employment, supported living programs. And we don't want our children to be uh, closing in the institutions of psychiatric clinics where we'll be not here. So this is the urgent uh, things and we walking uh, uh, along the through all ages from young ages towards the independent living and employment and that's actually a very big gap for us in our country and we still are learning a lot from our partners from international experience so now we are thinking how we could create the sustainable support for young adults as well and of course it's very good opportunities now with different kind of projects like mentorship program supported employment then we created the small um social kitchen, so whatever. So we need to think about more opportunities. And of course, we would like to encourage as well, uh, young women with uh, internet, intellectual disabilities, autism and neurodevelopmental disabilities, because this is a group of very vulnerable uh, group of uh, girls, which are still not uh, in the services. And many of the girls with uh, um, autism or neurodevelopmental disabilities are still hidden at home. So this is also important issue and we're trying to work together and work hard with our team and that. And of course, okay. to create the sustainable work of all existed programs, this is very important. So it's important to create new things and expand the services, but it's very important to have the sustainability for what we already have. For those children who are now in inclusive education and early intervention, so, so they, they should get all services, not just in our organization, it should be spread a lot. And we have the two actually big networks within the whole region, and we try to share with all this experience and help uh, in the regions to use the same approaches and methods and that will be uh, much effective for all our country and our children in our country. Well thanks Lola. It's, it's a you know I mean, you're thinking very long term about the sustainability and, and then what what happens to these young people when you know their parents uh, you know, pass away. I mean it's uh, yeah yeah it, 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 there's no victory that's means okay we've solved the thing there's always another another phase another step another problem to solve another way to apply your ingenuity and creativity so let me just say to lola and hannah and sakina congratulations and um it's been a real honor getting to know um you lola and hannah a little bit over the past couple of weeks and sakina it's been fantastic to reconnect um and uh, just congratulations and thanks so much for spending the time. Um, also wanted to give a special thanks to uh, Maya and Marianne uh, for joining us. Um, Maya and Marianne are also members of the selection committee along with Flora Birdsell and Dina Kimball and, and me. Um, so thanks to Flora and Dina as well uh, for spending the time uh, on the very difficult task of um, uh, reading all of the well, inspiring but difficult task of reading about all the fantastic organizations nominated and trying to come up with uh, a way to honor as many as we can with a special shout out to Joe Bettenerich, who Lola mentioned. Um, he's now on sabbatical. I don't know if he's joining today, but he's kind of he kind of runs this uh, process for us. Um, 
and for the whole GFC team for bringing forward and nominating such amazing organizations. Um, and of course, if you'd like to stay in touch with Global Fund for Children, uh, go to our website, globalfundforchildren.org, sign up for our newsletter, feel free to make a donation. Uh, we're active on Twitter, we're active on Instagram, we're active on Facebook, we're active on LinkedIn. Um, so there's plenty of amazing stories um, that we're sharing you know, all the time. You know, plenty of ways to, to be involved. And uh, I'd just like to thank all of you who attended today. I hope uh, it was inspiring, uh, as inspiring for you as it uh, always is for me you know, to be among such uh, fantastic uh, uh, leaders. So with that, I will, I will close with uh, general thanks for everybody who helped produce the event. Take care, everybody.